to, to bring you up to date to where we are. Uh, we are thankful that uh, the Lord is starting to open more doors to get back into churches to uh, continue our, our deputation and to raise the support that we need for the ministry. Uh, COVID has uh, interrupted our lives uh, in a lot of ways. And uh, one of the ways that it has done that is um, our ability to get into areas where we've served. But God's timing is always right. He's sovereign and he, none of this has taken Him by surprise and nothing, take, uh, nothing happens behind His back. And so we, we are just grateful for the innovative things that, uh, that we've been able to do. And you know, Americans are good at innovation. Uh, when, when things uh, get difficult, we, we have ways, and as believers, God has ways of helping us and giving us uh, the things that we need to do uh, to do what we need to do uh, in spite of, of the devil fighting from every direction. And even though right now at this time we are not able to be feet on the grounds in these areas where we've served, and uh, most of our pictures in the latest video have been in on our trips to uh, India, uh, but we, we are thankful that uh, God has allowed us to serve in, in uh, several places in Africa and also in the, um, in the Middle East. Uh, Patty was able to get into a country that I'll not mention. Uh, it is a closed country, and yet we're thankful that uh, God allowed us to get over a thousand DVDs of the gospel into that closed country in 2014. And um, uh, those DVDs have since been pirated thousands of times over and, and given to people in that country uh, by missionaries and people who have been there uh, on the ground. Uh, and, and then we're, we're thankful for the, the work that God has allowed us to do in, uh, in Central America, uh, primarily around the capital in Managua, uh, where uh, we have been able to take teams uh, Patty started in 2006 with uh, a team of teams of ladies going in and and, and doing VBS and, and various types of ministry in churches with a veteran missionary has a Bible Institute and the graduates have gone out and started nearly 200 churches uh, in and around Managua and now expanding into the latest area that we have done ministry in and that is in the northeast part of Nicaragua uh, in Porta Cabasis. I'm sure Porta Cabasis has been on your TV some uh, here in recent days where the latest hurricane made landfall there. And uh, I'm, I've been in touch with, with the pastors, especially one, uh, the Jerusalem Baptist Church in, in Porta Cabasis. And, and those, those people are in need of our prayers today. And we're thankful that uh, due to the work of, of these national pastors, and, and uh, the missionary that we have been working with. Uh, the Bible Institute has now been established in Porta Cabasis. On our last trip, we were able to uh, distribute Bibles that had been given uh, to the Mesquite Indians in, in that area. Uh, the, the gentleman that you saw sitting down reading the Bible uh, was the first time that he had ever held a Bible in his language. Uh, we, uh, we had gone out on the pier to give out Bibles. Uh, we had given him one on our way out on the pier, and when we returned, uh, we were returning back to our van, and he was sitting on that pier reading. For the first time in his life, the Word of God. And folks, that's what it's all about. Uh, and I hope that you will you'll pray that we'll still be able to uh, get back into these areas just as soon as possible. But again, going back to the innovative means that God gives us, uh, I'm able to meet with, uh, with missionaries uh, around the world Monday through Friday at 9 o'clock uh, in Zoom meetings. And uh, what, what a wonderful thing it is to look at my computer and see these people uh, everywhere from Nepal to South America to wherever and, and, and pray with them and to be able to try to encourage them. And these days, uh, when, when COVID has been an instrument of Satan to keep us off the field, we can go right to the field by way of, of technology that, quite frankly, I don't know a whole lot about. Uh, but I'm thankful that I can, I can get in a Zoom meeting and see these folks who are so faithful on the mission field and try to be an encouragement to them. 
Uh, I hope that you'll continue to pray for, for Patty and myself as, as we do our best to get back on track with, with some meetings. I guess you could label us officially as geezers on deputation, uh, but we, we are so thankful for, for what God is doing, and we covet your prayers, and thank you so much uh, for allowing us to be here with you today. Uh, pastor has asked me if I would bring a, a message this morning involving missions, and I, I told him I, I don't do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not really interested in doing that. Uh, no, I'm very interested in doing that, and I uh, want to bring you a message this morning. And if you'll go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28, and uh, we'll read a couple of verses there, and then we'll go to Mark chapter 16. Uh, while you're finding your, your place in the Word of God, uh, let me just mention this. Uh, when we think of missions, we usually think of the verses that I'm going to read to you in just a few moments, what we call the Great Commission. But can I just remind you this morning that missions did not begin with the Great Commission? We need to understand that missions began with God. It first beat in His heart before it was ever breathed as the life-sustaining force into His church and for us to be involved in His Great Commission. God, our God, is mission-minded. And when we think about that, if He were not, if God were not mission-minded, there would be no Christian mission. There, there would be no mission for us this morning. The gospel He has given us is a missions message. And if it, if it could not save every sinner, then we need to understand there would be no reason to take it to every nation. But I'm thankful this morning that if we have the Great Commission... And if God's Word is true, and it is, every word of it, from Genesis to Revelation, the Great Commission, folks, is a missions mandate. I am thankful that no matter where we go with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you cannot take the gospel to the wrong person. I'm thankful this morning that we have a whosoever will may come uh, and accept the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. And as this church is involved in local church ministry, Missions begins in this congregation, and it begins exactly where God said it was to begin, and that is in your Jerusalem, which would be Milford, Delaware. And then as God allows, it, it expands into Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost. But we've got to remember that if we're going to be involved in missions the way God wants us to be involved in the Great Commission, it's got to be involved in our Jerusalems. It's got to be involved in our home churches where, where God's people uh, decide they are going to be actively involved in worldwide missions, and I'll be saying more about that later on. But let me begin by reading the verses out of Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus speaking here, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And then if you'll go with me over to Mark chapter 16, and we'll read just one verse here, and we'll be targeting this verse uh, throughout the message today. Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15. And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This morning, I'd just like to spend a few minutes with you talking about God's love and God's mission. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You this morning for the opportunity that we have to be in Your house. Father, we begin by praising You, by praising Your holy, awesome name, and thanking You for Your love. And Father, I pray that You would help me this morning uh, as, as, as a preacher, uh, and humanly speaking, to, to try to, to even touch the skirts of the garment of the topic of your love. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us when we're not, a, when we're not always lovely. Thank you, Father, for being the example of love that we need uh, in our lives today. And Father, I pray that you would also help me today 
as I attempt to connect your awesome love with your mission. And Father, I pray that your love would be so embedded in our hearts, Father, that we would have a desire to to be involved in your mission and to be doing the things that you would have us to do. Father, it's my prayer before I go any further today in this service that if there's anyone here that does not know the Lord Jesus as personal Savior, I pray that they would need their, see their need to accept Him today. And Father, whatever you do in the hearts of your people or in the heart of someone who may need Christ, may we give you the glory and the honor for what you'll do when we walk out of here today. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. A strong missions program, I believe, in any church rests on three foundations. And I want to talk to you about those three foundations this morning. And the first one being, it rests on the compassion of our God. It rests on a compassionate God. Can I begin as we think about His compassion to to say something about the description of God's love? And I believe there's no greater place that we can go to in the Word of God than to the golden scripture text that we know as John 3.16. Most of you, if not all of you this morning, probably know that by heart. As a matter of fact, to the glory of God, uh, let's, let, let's quote it this morning. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's spend a few moments as we talk about a description of God's love and His compassion. As we think of John 3.16, would you notice with me, first of all, we see a love that is extravagant. The verse says, For God so loved. It is a love so infinite that it's everlasting. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3, we read this, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Do you understand that when we read a verse like that, it is telling us, it's telling us this morning that God's love is so incomprehensible that it passes all knowledge. When we read in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul said, and to know the love of Christ. And he says, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. When we read a verse like that, do you understand that when Paul said, it passeth knowledge? What is that saying about the description of God's love this morning? I believe it is telling us that when we get on the topic of God's love like we are right now, you can never get to the end of it. You can never get to the end of God's love. I am thankful that it is a love so indiscriminate that it would be given to the least worthy of sinners. And all of us need to remember this morning, no matter how good we may think we are, we do not deserve the love of God. We do not deserve the love that He has commandeth toward us that while we were yet sinners, all of us, Christ died for us. It's it's extravagant, His love is. And then it's also exhaustive. I'm glad that verse goes on to say, For God so loved, what does it say next? The world. It is a love that says that God is not willing that any should perish. It is a love that is fully comprehensive. I like what 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our God, our loving God, is not willing that any should perish, but that all men should be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I'm often asked, and I'm sure many of us have thought in our minds before, why does God put off His judgment of this world? Why does God put off His judgment regarding the evil things that are going on in our own country right now that breaks our hearts? And I could go into a long list of things. Why does God put off His judgment of this world? 
I believe the answer is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 that I quoted part of it just a moment ago. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He's wanting people to trust Christ. He's wanting people to believe in His Son. When we think about God's love and His, His compassionate love, we're giving a description or attempting to this morning of God's love. And, and I'm thankful that it's extravagant, it's exhaustive. But hallelujah, we can say that it's expressive. We go on in that verse, For God so loved the world that He did what? He gave, He gave His best. He gave His only Son that you and I might have life. That you and I might have everlasting life in heaven. That we can know that when we accept the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior, that we don't have to worry about what's going to happen to us after we leave this life. The best is yet ahead. The best is yet ahead. We are talking about the compassionate love of God. And when we think of gifts... Patty and I have been given some great gifts over the years. But no gift, no greater gift has been given to us or to any of you here this morning or anyone under the sound of my voice than the gift of God giving His precious Son, the Lord Jesus, to die for us. This morning we're looking at a description of God's love and talking about His compassionate love. It's, and we need to be thankful this morning as I've just given you a description of God's love, what a great thing it is to move on in this message and not only talk about a description of the love of God, but a demonstration of God's love. You see, the demonstration of God's love is that He promised a Savior to deal with the problem of sin. And you know I'm thankful, as I've said already, that from Genesis to Revelation, we find the infallible and errant truth of a loving God. But we can go to the very first book of the Bible when God promised that He would give a Savior to deal with the problem of sinful man. In Adam and Eve in the garden, in Genesis 3.15, Jesus said this, God said this to Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What is that verse? What is that verse saying to us this morning about God's love and a demonstration of God's love? It is telling us this morning that the verse is an Old Testament pronouncement of the gospel. It is a promise that was repeated and amplified throughout the Old Testament, and it rested on a solid rock. It rested upon the unconditional sovereign I will of God. All of the acts that we see in the Old Testament were performed with the fulfillment of this promise in mind that God gave us, that God would give us a Savior to deal with the problem of sin. And folks, I'm thankful this morning that I can stand before you and with all confidence, God is good on His promises. Amen. He promised to give us a Savior to deal with the problem of sin. And hallelujah to the Lamb of God this morning. He not only promised a Savior, He provided a Savior to deal with the problem of sin. You see, when the plan of God was complete... God sent forth His Son to be mankind's Redeemer. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So what do we have? According to the eternal purpose of our loving, compassionate God, we have this demonstration of His love that Christ died for our sins, He was buried, and He rose again the third day, and that we call what? We call the gospel. Paul made it so clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we can say today, in spite of our indifferences, in spite of our failures, in spite of the weakness of our flesh, to the glory of the everlasting praise of God, salvation is now offered on sole condition of our faith and trust 
in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. Oh, listen, we can sing with all confidence the wonderful words of the song, By God's word at last, by my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. And if you've never accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, I pray today that you would see your need of turning to the Christ of Calvary. I'm thankful that our missions program can rest on a compassionate, loving God and the things that we've mentioned. But would you notice with me, secondly, I believe our mission message rests upon a compelling message. I love the book of Romans. I was sharing with the men this morning just briefly. I don't have time this morning, but God, God used the book of Romans to help me yield my life to ministry. Uh, I was a shy high schooler and junior high, and God was working on my heart about gospel ministry. But I had, I had a handicap. I, was, I stuttered awful. And I, could, I told the guys this morning, I said, I could make a conversation last a half hour that ought to be over in about five minutes. I mean, that's, that's just how, how bad I was. But folks, I'm, I'm glad that when we look at the Apostle Paul and in, in the book of Romans, he said, hey, anyone who is ready to, to listen to the message and who's ready to be a carrier of the message, I'll take base things, I'll take weak things, I'll take things that are, that are not accepted necessarily by man, and I'll use them for my glory. He even went as far to say that I'll use somebody for the gospel message and I hope this will go to the heart of someone today, maybe a young person, that God would use this in your heart to go to the mission field. You're saying, boy, I could never do that. I can, You know, that's exactly what I was saying when I was about the age of many of you in here today. But folks, as, as someone may look at me as they did, I'm sure they looked at me when I yielded to Christ for, for full-time Christian service, uh, they said, that dude's a zero with a ring rubbed out. I mean, there's just nothing there to see. But you know, I'm glad that the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I will use something that is not. Now, what is something that's not? That's somebody with a zero with a ring rubbed out that man may see nothing. But I'm glad that God sees so much more in you than you see in yourself and that people may see around you that He can take and use you today to be what that chapter ends talking about. And the whole reason God likes using zeros with a ring rubbed out is that when we do something, it's not about us. What we've been able to do in missionary work and, and in preaching and in whatever God has allowed to do, it has not been about Patty and it has not been about me. It has been about the God that we serve. And he says in Romans chapter 1 that if you will serve me and understand that it's not about you and that I receive the glory, God can use a zero with a ring rubbed out. God is ready to use anyone who is ready to give Him glory and how thankful we need to be. But that's how Paul was. Paul was a man who didn't have a good background. He had a big religious background, we know that. But he goes on to say in Romans chapter 1, I am debtor. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. I am indebted to mankind, he said. And he went on to say, so much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And boy, here's a message that we need from Paul this morning to help us, whether we're knocking on a door here in Milford or Jacksonville or in India or Africa, wherever we may be, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew and also to the Greek. Folks, we have a compelling message. And Paul knew that having received the greatest message in the world, that he was compelled to share it with whomever he could. So great was the burden and the desire in his heart and the obligation that he had to serve his God that he wrote in 1 Corinthians 19, 16. He said, Yo, woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah kind of felt the same way. 
Jeremiah, if you read the, 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 the prophecy of Jeremiah in his book, Jeremiah got in a lot of trouble for preaching. And he was thrown in prison. He was thrown in a dungeon. And Jeremiah got to the point that he was being treated so bad that he said, I'm just going to stay. And what he was saying was, this preaching is getting me in so much trouble, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. But his prophecy goes on to say, his message goes on to say, and this is kind of the Appleby translation. He said, I can't keep my mouth shut. My heart is on fire with the, with the message that I need to give to people. They need to hear what I have to say. And folks, that is exactly what Paul was saying here when he said, Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we think about a compelling message, what makes the gospel? What makes the gospel so compelling this morning? I believe, first of all, it's got to be that it's a distinct message. Do you understand that, and we see this in our travels or different places where we've been, and we can see it right here in the States. You can see it right here in Milford. And that is that every major religion relies upon performance for salvation. You can talk to someone who is a Hindu, and he preaches a fourfold path to salvation. Buddhism leads its followers down an eightfold path to salvation. Salvation offered by Islam rests upon five pillars. Catholicism rests upon fulfilling five sacraments. Folks, we've got to understand that as, as religion rests upon performance, Christianity and someone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior does not rest upon performance, at least our performance. It rests upon a person. It rests upon a person for salvation. You see, Jesus announced, I am the way, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Peter declared, there is none other name whereby we must be saved, in Acts 4.12. Paul said, through this man, Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin, Acts 13.38. What, what do these verses say? Folks, these verses are saying that the gospel finds its source, its content, and meaning in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And apart from Him, there is no salvation. You see, other religions tell men what they must do to be saved. The gospel that I'm preaching about and that we need to carry to the world tells men what has been done that we might be saved. It's a distinct message. But you know, it's also compelling because it's a dynamic message. Going a little further into Romans chapter 1, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He goes on to say, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. So we, we have a question that arises here, and the question is, why is the gospel such a compelling message? Well, I think, first of all, the, the, Bible, the, the gospel is a, a compelling message because it's a particular message. When you read through the Bible, there are many messages in it. You get all kinds of messages from Genesis to Revelation, but only one message in this book qualifies as the gospel. You see, the gospel facts are Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and then He rose again the third day. And then having completed, and may I say by Himself, all that was needed to redeem mankind, therefore we have the gospel message. It is a particular message. Therefore, when we accept Christ as our personal Savior, we can rejoice with the songwriter who says, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child. And forever I am. Oh, listen, the gospel is not only a particular message, it's a powerful message. The gospel is the one message that has the power to save man from the penalty of sin. 
And we've got to understand that this gospel, as, power, as powerful as I have tried to portray it this morning, this powerful message, the gospel of Jesus, does have its limitations. And we have got to get a hold of this, and it's got to be something that is in our heart as a burden, and it's got to be carried out in how we do ministry in this church and how we do ministry around the world. And that is that it cannot save until it's been believed. And it cannot be believed until it's been heard. And it cannot be heard until it's preached. We have the responsibility to share this compelling message to a world that is in need of Christ. So as we think about a compassionate God and a compelling message, this has got to lead us to the final thing that I want to share with you this morning, and that is a commissioned people. A commissioned people. In Mark 16 and verse 15, let me, let me read that verse again. And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So when we read this verse, what is it saying? What is it saying to this church this morning? That's where we've got to get down to the now and now that we can do what God wants us to do with His compassionate love and then the compelling message. We've got to understand that this is saying that every member of this church needs to be involved. And that missions is not a biblical suggestion. It is an imperative. Jesus said, go. Go ye into all the world. And he goes on to say that we are, he says, he doesn't say go neighbor or, or go this or go that. We've got to understand that missions is, is not only an imperative, it's, it's inclusive for us today. What does it say? It says, go ye. Go ye into all the world. Well, a question might arise in your mind. Who be ye? <laughs> Who be ye this morning? Well, let me just tell you, ye be me. And ye be thee. And ye be we. God is speaking to all of us. No one is exempt from the responsibility of evangelizing the lost. Christ's command means that you are either sent or you send. Not everyone in this auditorium this morning can go into worldwide missions, but everyone can have a part in worldwide missions. You cannot remain unresolved and be obedient to Jesus Christ. You cannot become uninvolved and be obedient to Christ. Now, I didn't come here to offend you, but I'm telling you, you cannot be obedient to Christ unless you are involved in world missions. You can pray. Everybody can pray. Everybody can pray. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Ladies, that's not leaving you out. And Brother, Brother Troy's been all the way through Greek too, and I'm sure he could, he could back that up this morning. Uh, it's, you can pray... You can give and you can go. What is that saying? That is saying that this compelling message is a commission for all of us. All of us, every age group represented here today, can be involved in some kind of missions here. And we've got to be willing to submit ourselves to Him and understand that in this message that I've tried to focus on God's love and God's mission is not just about God's heart for missions. It's also about our heart and what we're doing for worldwide missions. That's every member involved. God's heart is every man being evangelized. You say, well, well, <laughs> preacher, every man evangelized, go ye into all the world. Uh, are we going to see everybody saved? No, we're not going to see everybody saved but we've got to be doing our part. I read the story about a little boy uh, who was out on the seashore and a storm had just gone through and I, I love to go out to the beach in, in Florida after a hurricane's gone by and you can find some really nice things on the beach. 
And, uh, but this, this little boy, after a storm had gone through, had, had gone out on the beach, and hundreds of seahorses had washed up on shore after that storm. And so this, this, this little boy was walking down the beach, and for all he was worth, he was, he was picking up seahorses and throwing them back into the water. And this man saw him, and he said, Son, what are you doing? And the little boy looked up at him, and he said, Sir, I'm saving seahorses. <laughs> and, and, and he said, the man looked at that little boy and he said, Son, you're not going to save all these seahorses. You're not going to make a difference in all these seahorses. Look at them all here all over the beach. And the little boy picked up another seahorse and he tossed it in the ocean. And he said, Sir, it made a difference in that one. And folks, that's our mission commission. That's how we've got to look at evangelizing the lost and, and understand that God expects us to do our part Henry Martin said this, and I close with this thought. The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of missions. And the nearer we get to Him that is nearer to Christ, the more intensely missionary we must become. You see, we have a, we have a compassionate God who loves the world. And we need to understand that if we are going to be in the center of His will today, we've got to want to share that love He has given to us and be a part of His mission. We're all about being on our missions. Boy, we can get involved in things. The greatest mission in the world is God's mission. And God sent His only Son, Jesus, to this world. He said to do what? To save to seek and to save those who are lost.